All of us depend on nature. And it's no short story or exaggeration to say that an artist can help conserve nature in a lot of ways. The word biodiversity gets thrown around all the time. It's in the news, it's on the radio, it's in print. We never define what biodiversity means. I hate these words that are so imprecise that you say it all the time, if you don't know what it means, then it means nothing. So the textbook definition of biodiversity is the biological variety and variability of life on Earth. It's a measure of variation of ecosystems and species. In a nutshell, biodiversity is all life on Earth, all right? But what you may not know is that approximately Okay, 40% of all species on Earth live in the canopies of forests. Almost half. Almost half of all life on Earth is found in the tops of forests. Can you all see a climb on that photo? Yep. That's one hell of an amazing tree. Yeah. Can anyone, some of you might know this person. I know that at least one of you knows this person. Does he live in Fiji? He used to live in Bellingham. James Muche? James Muche. That's my friend James. On the soils in Panama. One of the most amazing trees ever. So about 40% of life on Earth lives in the forest. And if we want to have some, like, terms, some actual numbers that we can use to define biodiversity, I want to ask you, and I'll define what it means, how many species of epiphytes live in hundred uh, one hectare? A hectare is a box that's 100 meters on a side, so about the size of a football field, and the epiphytes are the plants that grow on other plants. So when you see these mosses and stuff and, and all of these, those are epiphytes. Tropical rainforests are totally laden with epiphytes. So I want you to take a guess how many species of epiphytes live in one hectare of this forest in, in Monterrey, Costa Rica. 600. How many of you think 200? Raise your hand if it's 200. How many think it's 400? Raise your hand if you think it's 400. We got three, four, four. How many think it's uh, 600? Okay, so we've got some more people who say 600. 800 species. <laughs> no, that's not even a great question. Meters. Trip. Trip. 800 species. It's approximately, um, is it say two tons? Yeah. Yeah, two tons of plants are growing on the surface of other plants. Wow. If you were to strip the epiphytes out of this photograph, you would lose about 35% of the green matter in the top of this tree. Wow. Okay? That's amazing. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why epiphytes matter. Here's another one. This guy got really famous in the 1980s. His name is Terry Irwin. This experiment was that he did became so famous that he was like a rock star in science. He's got a cannon that's shooting an insecticide fog into the top of the forest. He aims it at the top of the forest. He's got these sheets suspended at the ground. The insecticide kills the insects and they fall on the sheets. He fogged 19 trees. And all 19 trees were the same species, okay? And in one he hectare of this forest, there can be hundreds of tree species. Can you imagine that? Hundreds of tree species in 100 square meters? And so this is called canopy fog. And he got really famous with this experiment. So how many beetles do you think were in 19 trees of the same species? 1,200. <laughs> 1,200. Uh, 1,200. Just, yeah. just yeah, but how beetles. How many beetles were on the tree? 13 yeah, million? Huh? Individual. Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> this is 1,200 species. Yeah, he cataloged everything. Just of beetles. We're not talking about ants or spiders or crickets or grasshoppers or cicadas or katydids or anything else. Just beetles. The fog, the fog killed them or just knocked them out? Of the, just it knocked kills them. them. When they fall on the sheets and then he puts them in jars of alcohol, then he takes them to the Smithsonian and then he catalogs all of them. Wow. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> so that's biodiversity. That is biodiversity. That's cool. Yeah, that's biodiversity. Yeah. Okay. 
Here's, here's an example that I love because I'm a bird person. Okay, I'm a bird person. And this is a toucan. If I have two cans of soup, that's a toucan. But this, I love to say toucan because I just like to speak Spanish. In one country in, in South America, Colombia, there are 20 species of toucans. Did you even know that there were 20 species of toucans in the world? In one country, Colombia, there's 20 species of toucans. And where do they live? In the canopy. They don't walk on the ground. These facts are important not just because they're fun facts. And you know, you can like share them later with the people who didn't come. Hey, how many you know beetle species did Terry Irwin find? You're like, what? Okay. There's this thing that we call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the benefits that a rainforest provides to us, or a forest, or nature provides to us. That can be precipitation, it can be food that we harvest, okay? Epiphytes, those plants that we talked about. We can't hear. Hey, Roger? Yeah. Ecosystem services are the benefits that humans get from nature, and epiphytes collect moisture in the cloud forest. There are forests at a certain elevation in Costa Rica and Honduras and South America where the clouds hit the forest, the moisture condenses on the plants, the water flows down the trees into the streams and feeds the cities. That's where they get their water. They don't have snow melt like we do. So their water comes from cloud forests. These epiphytes grow soil. They manufacture soil. Okay? They manufacture nutrients because insects that die and get trapped in there decompose and then that decomposed soil falls on the ground and, and nurtures the forest where people live and then they get their nutrients from the forest as well. Those are ecosystem services. That's important because with climate change, the cloud layer, the cloud level in these forests is going up and the forests are drying out and the cities like San Jose, Costa Rica are losing the water. Okay, here's a good one. A single bat can be 1,500 mosquitoes in an hour. Who's opposed to that? <laughs> People are like terrified of bats. Okay, well, I'd rather have one bat than 1,500 mosquitoes. Okay. And if you've got a colony of bats, then you put up a bat box, because you're an arborist, and you can climb a tree, and some homeowner say, I'll pay you, you know, to put up a bat box, there's the real benefit. And now for the arborist crowd, here's another one. Bats pollinate this flower. And this flower is the agave flower. And agave is where tequila comes from. So if you like tequila, you can't have tequila without bats. So if you like tequila, thank the bats. Nailed it. All right. Now, here's what's happening all across the Americas. We've all, we've all witnessed this, OK? Nature is taking it in the pants everywhere. Well, in countries with the highest population growth rate and the least governmental control on the use of natural resources, like tropical rainforest, that's even more true. And tropical rainforests are getting cut down amazingly fast. And the truth is, if we want to conserve biodiversity, we can't conserve, you can't, you can't conserve, you can't save what you don't know. If Terry Irwin hadn't collected 1,200 species of beetles, we might not know that those species even existed. A lot of those species were new, like they fell onto a sheet, and he had to say, this is a new species and put a name on it. Okay? All right. So you can't conserve what you don't know. And I'm going to introduce you, let's see here. In a minute, I'm going to introduce you to some special people. But here's, uh, I want to talk to you about how scientists climb trees, because I'm a scientist. And I go to conferences where scientists show up their knowledge, they give these 12-minute talks. Like you guys compete in a seven-minute tree climb, they compete with these 12-minute talks. And you know, someone gets an award for the best talk. So I go to conferences and I talk with scientists and they say, I know how to climb trees. And I talk with them and I think, you have no idea how to climb trees. So I wanted to find out how scientists climb trees, and I've published three papers now in scientific journals about how scientists climb trees. So it's no longer a point of opinion. A scientist says, I know how to climb trees. I'm like, no, you know. I did research. I have numbers. Okay? 
most scientists climb on handheld ascenders like this with June ones. I have learned that. I knew that before, but now I've proved it because I've got the numbers. They do a, you know, a tree frog or a Texas two-step or something up a rope on June ones. Now, what is one of the most critical safety advantage of the modern tree climbing systems we have, whether you're on a moving rope system, SRT, whatever you want to call them, stationary rope system. What's one of the main safety advantages? You can descend you on can, the same. Huh? You can descend on the same system. Instantly. Instantly. You can get out instantly. There are wasp nests in some of these trees that are this big, and the wasps are this big. And, and the forest can be so dense. This is in the support. Right in South America, the foliage is so dense that you can't see that nest until you get up there. How would you like to bump into that on this system? No. Okay. And another advantage is the biodiversity that we're talking about occurs everywhere in the space of the tree crowns. It's not just next to the tree trunk where your rope is. And on this system, you can't get to the branch tips where some of those delicate epiphytes live, where a hummingbird might have a nest. Where there's some orchid growing that no one has ever seen before, and it's new to science and has no name. You can't get there out of the system. We did a really cool paper in 2015, and I want to say that I want to emphasize why all of you are here and why this talk is for you. These names highlighted in yellow are co-authors on these papers, and they are arborists. Certified working arborists. Scott Altenhoff is up there. Will Kunjin is up there. Brian French is up there. Those are names that I bet a lot of you have heard. Okay? Arborists help write these papers and do this research. We did a really cool paper in 2015 where we did an online survey that we sent all around the world. It was written in four languages. The survey was done in four languages. So at the beginning, you could choose what language, English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. We wanted to get scientists in Africa, scientists in Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, the United States, Canada, Europe, Germany, French, everywhere. And so we sent a survey out, and we got like 1,200 responses from scientists who climb trees. Okay, this isn't just scientists who work in a laboratory, scientists who climb trees, and we studied how they climb. And we found, if you read this graph on the left here, green means that they can do it, and red means they can't. So of those climbing scientists, most of them report that they can get up and down a tree crown. But as you walk out on the branch, look how many scientists are not able to get to. These are branch tips, and this number four is in between trees. So very few scientists can get to a branch tip, and almost none of them can get to the space in between trees. And you're all going to compete doing that or be the text in the comps for arborists who are going to these spaces here. Scientists can't do that. If you can't do that, if, if, if you don't have that ability to walk out onto the ends of the branches, it limits how we understand life on Earth. And if we don't understand life on Earth, we can't say it. If scientists don't know how to do that, if they don't know how to limb walk, scientists do not know how to limb walk because they're on a Jumar system, and if there's one thing that's pretty common with scientists, thanks, Bob. You owe me a hug for that and three cookies. <laughs> well, there's another guy over there. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that's common with scientists is that they're so specialized that they think they know a lot and their ego can get out of place. And if they think they know how to climb and they don't know how to climb, who's going to train the scientists? You've got a big pool of people who all think they know what to do. You are the secret to training the scientists. I mean that. I mean that. So I want to talk with you about tropical forests and all of the people who live in Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and, and benefit from this nature and live in those countries that are natives of, of those countries. And I want to introduce you to them. But there's one thing that's really important to me, and that I think learning doesn't come from sitting on a chair and listening, learning comes from participating, and learning comes from teaching. 
So I want all of you to participate in the middle of this talk for the next, I'll give you two minutes. I want you to turn to who's ever closest to you, everyone find a partner, somebody, and for two minutes, I want you to each think of a moment in your life Dang, I get so emotional. And an individual who had an impact on you, who helped you out in a way that you didn't think was possible, and changed your life. For the My high school band teacher. So everyone, that just do that. Fun. How often you didn't have to think long for that one. Right. Think of that person in that time. I I was I was the the sure. Right. They're all alive here for two minutes. I like that very quiet. I would like a couple of volunteers to share the story that they learned from their friend about this everlasting impact that someone had on their life. So do we have a volunteer who can share the story that they just heard? Keep okay, scoot over about a foot. Who has a story? Come on. I'll put you on the spot, Dave. Okay. Greg just told me that a couple hours ago you took him up. Taught him his system, got him in a tree for his very first time ever. And he was saying that you completely changed his perspective and his life, and he's just stoked. They put that together beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, someone else has to have a story about it. That was a good one. That was a good one. I want to hear one more. <laughs> If you don't volunteer, I can volunteer. We're all tied we, we did it all ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, come on, who has one more story? Yes, so, Fred. Fred's out there. So, everyone, I will share his story. And Fred, go talk to me. I was taught by a few of the idiots. And then I was like, Bob, Bob and, uh, and Mike. Yeah, try again. Okay. okay, so he was saying that when he was in high school, yeah, he did an outdoor ed program, and there was a specific teacher who taught him essentially to go out there, challenge himself, and to enjoy the experience, and to enjoy being out there in the, in, in, in nature and the life. And so for him, that was a very changing experience. That was pretty fun. Is it, it's pretty safe to say that none of us who is here in this room would be the people that we are without someone who had happened to us. Going out and meeting all these people in person and climbing with most of them is what changed my, my perspective. There's more than just my right way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got a right way. And I learned different techniques and stuff will further my career. A lot of these people here I've climbed with and that, they've done that. Yeah, that's how we need to meet today. I'm really excited to climb with Mike and Zach because I've learned a lot. We have a challenge going on, although they're not in, so that's kind of hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to introduce you to some special people. <laughs> everyone in this photo, except for her, but everyone in this photo is a some sort of a scientist or scientific professional from South America. Sophie is from Argentina. Sophia is from Argentina. Banya is from Peru. Este, este señor is de Colombia. Uh, his name is Saint Luis. He's from Colombia. She's from. Uh, this is Evelyn from Ecuador, from Quito, Ecuador. David is from Peru, I think. And, and it just goes around the list. She's from Colombia as well. How many languages do you speak? I only speak two. I've tried to learn a bunch, but then I always fizzle out. <laughs> Navajo, Japanese, mosquito, all these languages. These, these people have something in common with you. They share a dream that you share. These people want more than anything else to learn how to climb trees. And they never had that opportunity until now. And that's the story that I want to tell you right now. How did they get up into those trees? There's this event called Discovery the Canopy for Research and Conservation of Biodiversity in Latin America, where a team of arborists raises money and equipment and hosts a training in somewhere in Central America or South America every year. We've had classes as small as eight and as big as 20. 
And it's the most amazing experience. And I want to tell you what that's like. And we're going to start with some of the instructors. These are the core instructors. One thing that all of these instructors have in common is everyone has an ISA arborist certification. They're all certified arborists. Four of them make their living solely from arboriculture. All right? Two of us are scientists, but even Patrick makes 30 or 40 percent of his income from arboriculture. And James Luce, one of the best people I've ever met, was my mentor, and he and I found him in this program. It's like, I know the one on the top floor. <laughs> and these instructors are creative and they have these novel techniques for teaching. What? This is a big papaya. You know, you get a papaya in the supermarket here and they're this big. You get a papaya in Colombia and they're as big as your helmet. And so, why does Noel Rodriguez, you know, who was in the Masters Challenge last year, holding a papaya with a hole in it? Because we stabbed it with a stick as a lesson to teach everyone, never go under a tree without PPE, right? You can talk to someone until they faint on you about wearing a helmet, but when you drop a stick on it and it punches a hole and you say, this could have been your head, no one forgets to put the helmet on. We have techniques where Noel is the greatest inventor and motivator in our crew. He, had, he hung his hammock over the river and to get to that hammock, you had to climb a tree, traverse to a second tree, come down that tree, and <coughs> sit in the hammock. And these students are doing that, and it's only their fifth day ever holding ropes or climbing trees. We can get them to that point because we have such good instructors and a good curriculum, but we get into their hearts. We get into their hearts to find what they want, what motivates them, what their fears are and what their beliefs are, and where they love life and how they love life. That's how in five days we get students sitting in a hammock over the water. Coach did that three weekends ago or so. We did it all the way across the river. Nice. It was badass. I didn't do it. I was too busy floating down the river, conquering, conquering the Shenandoah. <laughs> This is one of, one of the stories that I like a lot. That's James teaching a class in Honduras. All the students are either from Honduras or El Salvador. And these military soldiers, a lot of people freak out. If you've never seen soldiers carrying automatic weapons and they just walk in on you, like, freak some of us out. But they were doing a patrol because we were in a national park and they knew we were there and they were keeping us safe. And then they were really curious to see James teaching knots. So I had to work hard to get this photograph. I'm like, first I ask permission, I like make eye contact, point at the camera, I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I'm like getting into the position where I can show James teaching the students with these military rifles in the back and the soldiers. But there's lots of adventure stories. Descubriendo el docente, the serving the canopy we call it, Descubriendo el docente. We're holding the fifth version in 2024, in February of 2024 in Columbia, South America. Okay. Uh, this is the actual flyer for the course, and we're taking applications. We're going to have 20 or 25 students, and we'll probably get 80 to 120 applications. The students come from everywhere. These are the applications we've gotten. We've gotten applications from almost every country in the Americas. Almost every country in the Americas. Because they share this dream that you have to climb trees, and this training is not available to them. There is no one down there. They can't go to a comp like this. They're, they're starting to happen. So there's a comp this week in Bolivia. And there's a comp, an annual comp in Mexico. Okay, so across the Americas, we're going to have one in Bolivia and one in Mexico and one in Brazil. And if you don't live near those sites and you can't afford to travel, you're out of luck. They have no act. You can't buy the equipment. A harness that costs you $500 in this country costs triple that in South America. The student that I showed you named Evelyn is a biologist. And as a biologist, she is so underpaid. Her salary is $500 a month. She lives with her parents. And after paying for her living expenses, she has no money for climbing equipment. 
So last year, I gave her a rope wrench with a tether and a pulley and everything, and she cried. Because of one pulley, so here's some here's some uh, photos of our students and instructors learning what tree climbing is like in the rainforest. Last year we got we always had jerseys, but last year we got sublimated jerseys to acknowledge our sponsors. <laughs> And when you have a bunch of students in a green background with these day glow blue shirts on, it really looks cool. They learn everything about tree climbing. They start, out of 20 students, we might have two who have gone rock climbing before, and maybe one of those has only rock climbed on a, on a wall, not even on rocks. And the rest haven't used a rope or a pulley or anything. Uh, this is Eric, and she had actually climbed trees before. But most of them have zero experience. They have to learn. How to install a rope in a tree? How to attach a system to a rope? What's the difference between a moving rope system and a stationary rope system? How to limb walk? We've got five nights and five days to teach them all of that. It's a really amazing experience. This is Frances. She's from Peru. She's limb walking. The most quiet, soft-spoken, diminutive little woman you're ever going to meet and she's out on a branch. Okay. But we're going someplace special in a second. These are some of our graduating classes. This is what these young people look like at the end of a week. Look at the smiles and the emotion. People are really happy. It's pretty common at the end of one of these trainings for students to cry. Because they cannot believe that some foreigners would go out of their way to make this course happen. Now the important thing that you need to know about this event is none of the students can afford it. We have to fly all the instructors down there. We have to come up with all the equipment. We have to pay for everybody's food and lodging. Okay. We charge them a small fee because if you don't pay for it, you're not invested. We've only ever had one person be a no-show and they had received a scholarship and didn't have to pay. They didn't even let us know, they just didn't show up. So we collect a fee, but the course is like, the fee is about 16% of the price of the course. So we have to raise money. And they, we, we get donations, we get grants, we sell stuff. But they can't believe that some foreigners would organize a course for them and change their lives. They never thought it possible. We've had students say, I wanted to climb my whole entire life. I never thought it was going to happen. You made my dream come true. So when I say that they learn how to limb walk, install a line, they learn how to tie basic artwork knots, how to put on a harness and a helmet the right way, there's something more that these students learn. So, read that to yourselves. <coughs> this is a transformation. This is a before and after. This is a moment that changes people's lives. I like to say that we're rewriting the history of, con of forest conservation in Latin America by empowering these young people to climb trees. But we're making them newer versions of themselves that may not have been realized without that person who changed their lives. Nico said this. It was the last day of the class, everyone was getting on taxis and buses to leave. And he comes walking out of the hotel as I'm going up the steps and he just looks at me and he says this. The reason I did that exercise about sharing an impact that's been, you know, that you've received is because every one of you, Zach, Mike, 
right? Everybody has the power to have an impact on somebody else. We're going to get to more of your place to have an impact, but I want to emphasize that Arborists are vital research assistants. I've been recruiting this year Arborists to travel to South America to help some of our former students do research in the rainforest. Like in the Amazon on a boat on the river and then climb a tree. That kind of research. One of the best studies on epiphytes in the world in Costa Rica uses arborists. That's Juni Zuniga as technicians. You know Tyler from Juni. And that's what Kuhn did. Getting ready to lower a branch under research permit so that they can measure all the epiphytes growing on that branch. Who can cut a branch 100 feet high without knocking all the plants off and lower it to the ground? Scientists, I don't know how, I'm not going to know you. Okay? Those people? Yeah, it's on YouTube, right. Tie a ladder to the tree and stand on the ladder. <laughs> These are camera traps. These camera traps are installed in the canopy. It's a common research method. And here's an example of what we learned. This is a harpy eagle, the largest eagle in the world. Her talons, these claws, talons, are the size of grizzly bear claws. I have skinny arms. Her wrist is the size, her ankle is the size of my wrist. If she gets a hold of you, it's lights out. We install cameras, and this is her tiptoeing over her egg. Look how delicate she is. The largest aerial predator on the face of the earth tiptoes around her bed. And we know about their biology because we put cameras in their nests. You can do that. So what about these people? How do we make it happen? We've had donors from around the world help support discovering the canopy. <clears throat> but you don't have to be the owner or the manager of Petzl or Rock Exotica. Rucker Foundation or the Teufelberger, okay? You can be a local owner and operator like Hans, a New Jersey Ukraine expert, Hans and Jordan Thielman, okay? New Green, a nice little store in Victoria, Canada, up in BC, Canada, in Canada. So what, and we make sure that our donors are recognized in our social media. When we do Discovering the Canopy, we get typically 30,000 hits on social media over a week, over, over the course of the campaign, which can be a month. We get photographs like this. So what I want to say is that Karina over here has a box of gear that we got donated that we're going to raffle off over the next three days. So I'm going to work after this talk with them from Gaia Tree. Everyone is from Gaia Tree. Jorge, see? Jorge? Yeah. Okay. And Kenny are from Gaia Tree. We're going to set up a raffle. We don't have tickets, so you put your name on a piece of paper and we'll select your name at the end of mail. And you buy a ticket for 25 bucks. Your name goes into the raffle and you can have the equipment that's in there. We also have a silent auction on ropes. Luis has been on a rope. That money goes to pay for our students to take the course. So if you would like to make a donation to change the lives of these people, maybe we'll just set it up in here. I'm not sure where we're going to set it up. We'll make an announcement tonight or tomorrow. Please help us out. If you would like to sponsor, we need to raise $775 for every student who attends this course. OK? And so if you want to make a donation, buy a raffle ticket, come see me. If you want your company to be on the banners or the shirts or whatever, come see me. And if you are interested in volunteering on some of these projects, come see me. And if you haven't signed up for CEU, here's a sheet. And if you came to this talk and didn't get a sticker, I got the coolest logo around. So grab a sticker. So I hope that I connected this story about life on Earth 
and all of you and the power that you have to help conserve life on earth and make a difference in people's lives. Thank you very much. Thank you.